Thursday, 16th of May. Listener, what a pleasure to be with you again, particularly given that it's in the company of Duncan Alexander. Hi, Hello. Duncan. Nice to see you. Uh, Charlie Eccleshare. All right, Charlie. Hello. Nice to see you too. And especially nice to see you, Sasha Gurionov. Good morning, James. All right. You've been busy. You've been on your travels. Everywhere. Birmingham. Yeah. North London. Really? Good to Lord. South West London. <laughs> It's a strange Thursday morning, this. We're ahead of the, the final weekend of the season. Mm. Uh, Duncan, we're coming to the end of our rainbow. Yeah. And who will get the gold? Well, that's very much the question, isn't it? Mm. Although a question, the answer to which seems to be more and more concrete the more we look. Charlie, here's a thought I had uh, a short time ago, actually, when you came into the studio. Given your given your wonderful work with the Football Clichés fam, mm. um, what has this season... How has the Football Clichés lexicon expanded this season? What new what new entries have we had in the Football Clichés dictionary? That's a good question. Um, good process, I suppose, has been really? a thing. Is that all? Well, that, that's just one that comes to mind, and mm. I like applying sort of nonsense football speak to my own life. Of and course I, you And do. I'll amuse myself sometimes if, if my two sons do good sharing or something, I'll say, well done, boys, good process. <laughs> Which, obviously, <laughs> they, 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 it means nothing to them. I find it quite amusing, and these are the little wins one has to have with right. parents. What if you make a cup of tea and drop it on your foot? Is that good process? Do you use it for that? No, that's bad process. That's bad process, okay. Yeah. Right, but so you don't use it ironically? His, okay. no, his, his, his the Liverpool so. no, no. still yeah, bitter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Still yeah. Bitter. Very much. <laughs> yeah, all right, well... Uh, yeah, yeah, PSR. Not I the mean, only cup yeah. disappointment that... Uh, I mean, the, be, yeah. the word mate, not a new word, but probably been used more this season than right. for a long time. By yeah. one yeah. man. By one man, By yeah. By one man. Hmm, all right, well, not entirely over. City, <coughs> two points clear after their Spurs win. They could still blow it if they were to lose or draw against West Ham and Arsenal beat Everton. West Ham's record away to City, not the best, Duncan. Uh, 15 defeats from 17 trips in the right. Premier League. So, yeah, not great. Okay. okay. But, you know, <laughs> that, there's that, hope. They'll want to do it for Declan. Yeah. And uh, Moyes will want to do it for his old mate, Mikel. And as we know, desire is all that matters. You know, in a week where the obsession has been over what Spurs fans want. Mm. Um, and I think in run-ins generally, we apply so much to what team, you know, this idea of like, oh, but they're playing a team fighting for their lives. Right. As if that means every team that's fighting for their lives stays up and survives and mm. you know no but motivation is key i think we're detecting that this morning actually but uh, all the games we're kicking off sunday at four o'clock uh, but it is the 10th time in premier league history the title race has gone down to the final day curiously in all of those 10 or the previous nine occasions the team that started the day mm. on top has always gone on to win the title the last time that somebody came from behind as it were mm. Michael Sash, you remember Thomas. what it was? 1989. Yeah. The game at Anfield. Um, yeah, and I think that was actually the last game of the entire season. Yeah, it was a, the Monday mm -hmm. night. It was no, the season, Friday yeah. night, was it Friday, Friday night? night? Yeah, Friday, yeah. Night, Friday yeah. night. Friday night. So that was mm. very special circumstances. Very. Normal circumstances doesn't happen. Okay. I mean, the closest it's come in the Premier League era, probably, I oh, mean... Aguero. Aguero, yeah, mm. definitely. But also the, the West Ham, Man United, yeah. Blackburn, Blackburn, yeah. Liverpool, Blackburn, mm. 95. Uh, where United did everything but but score. There have also and been very Jules. few mm -hmm. even changes of lead on the final day. Obviously, it happened in that Aguero one, mm. but it didn't happen, even though it should have done. Even when City yeah, were two 0 down, yeah, yeah. To Villa, Liverpool it still never happened because Liverpool didn't score yeah. until. Yeah. You do, I mean, you know, sliding doors, etc. But you do wonder if City had heard that Liverpool were leading in their game, whether that would have, you know. Well, but the thing that was like a. Sad stroke, funny moments in that game because Liverpool finally scored. I think Salah went to celebrate, and someone in the crowd just ran three two to him, and yeah. or, or the fact that basically City scored, so it was it was for nothing. Poignant, mm. poignant. Well, City two 0 winners this Tuesday at Spurs, not only putting themselves in pole position for the title, but also ending Spurs' top four hopes. Fourth place goes to Villa after their three three with Liverpool on Monday. Spurs, in fact, now risk finishing below Chelsea in sixth spot. Are missing the cherished Europa League plays. Chelsea are three points behind Spurs after they beat Brighton 2 1 on Wednesday. Three points behind Chelsea, meanwhile, and battling over seventh and probably a Conference League spot are Newcastle and Manchester United after Ten Hag's side beat the Magpies 3 2 on Wednesday. All games we're going to be discussing in the course of today's show this weekend Arsenal host Everton, Man City host West Ham, Chelsea. Take on Bournemouth, Newcastle visit Brentford, and Man United go to Brighton. Brilliant. Let's begin 
with Tuesday night at Tottenham. Tuesday night at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium, Tottenham nil, Man City 2. Here's Johnny Blaine. Weirdest night of my life, and I've been to a Bjork concert. Right, Johnny. <laughs> well, Sasha and Charlie, you were both there. What, what was it like? It was weird. Um, it wasn't uh, like outright hostility towards their own team from Spurs fans. It was mm. more... It, for, for what should have been an absolutely massive game with a kind of huge atmosphere, it had more the feel of like a Sunday 2pm sleepy game after a Europa League right. Thursday against Burnley or someone. It was just quite quiet and subdued and flat and confused. Yeah, nobody knew what... It was almost as though I suppose had achieved the rare feat of silencing their own fans mm -hmm. by actually performing pretty well without definitively taking yeah. control. Yeah, and, and there would be moments when the kind of muscle memory would kick in and a Spurs player would make a big tackle and you can't help but cheer that as a fan almost. Mm. But then I always felt if it remained a contest, then fans couldn't help but get into it. I think if City had scored early, it would have become a farcical, go on lads, fill your boots, we want to lose this game 10-0 mm. kind of vibe. But because Spurs were playing really well for that first half... Uh, People couldn't help but get engaged with it. But it was strange. And obviously both times City scored, you know, chants erupt of, are you watching Arsenal? And all of that kind of thing, uh, which was obviously what... That was overhanging the whole occasion. And I think it was very disappointing and frustrating for Ange Postacoglu that, mm. you know, in a game that should they should have been roared on by their fans, uh, they weren't really. I mean, some, what, some what? were, but not... Would Maybe. it have made a difference had, say, the crowd been roaring on? And this is something that Ange spoke of or yeah. referenced at the end. Had Son been roared on by the Tottenham Hotspur faithful as he closed in on the Man City goal, would his shot have been any different? I don't know about that specific moment, but, yeah, Postacoglu referenced the fact that they've scored a lot of late goals at home this season and that the fans have been a big part of that. Having a good bench has often been a part of that. And I think as much as not having the fans roaring them on contributed to the fact they couldn't turn it around. They didn't have the kind of level of subs that they would have liked for this game either. But who knows? I mean, that individual moment, it's, yeah, it's it's impossible to say, I guess. But mm. it was certainly, Son not wasn't just the Spurs player you'd want running through to score that, probably in the whole league. I mean, he's always the XG over finisher, super, over performance uh, extraordinaire. So what happened? Was it Ortega? He regressed live on telly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we saw. Yeah, <laughs> we saw a real life regression. He shrunk. Yeah, and that, that, that moment when Son went through because I was up on the gantry because the press box was overflowing, so right. I had a good tactical view of the game mm. next to the lads from Sky. But when he, when the ball got to Son, I thought it was a jaw dropping moment, and there was a moment of silence because I think. A, it's like such a shock because it was a mistake by Akanji and City effectively put him into it. But I think there was genuinely, minds were scrambled. What to do? How to react? Mm. What if he scored? And I think the whole stadium was a moment of just total silence. Do you think his mind was scrambled? Uh, I don't think so because he was definitely wanted to get on the end of that ball. I don't think there was enough time in there thinking, hmm, yeah. should I score? Nah, and I ruined the mic. Hmm, should I score? Hmm, right. the goalkeeper. Hmm. I actually think Ortega did very well to come out yeah. and narrow the angle. Um, and he came also, he jumped just at the right time. So when it actually came, when you actually look at the shot, Son doesn't actually have that much to aim at. Yeah. Mm. Um, and and I think as a general point, Ortega did very well after coming on the he's, sub. He's so good, Ortega. Like, mm. I mean, he's arguably oh, better than Edison. Yeah. Obviously, no one likes to see the scenes that led to Edison mm. going off. That was a horrible, horrible injury. But you kind of do wonder if, if Edison had been there, maybe you mm. know, some would have scored. Ooh. There was another one as well, the Kulisevsky one. Sort of, mm. I mean, a, yeah. maybe a bit more fortunate, but a brilliant save. Mm. Um, shortly before there was one he didn't come for I think as well which he kind of recovered but talking back to the atmosphere and you know the, mm. the, the ground urging um, uh, you know the players on when Kulusevsky comes on and starts making those inroads this is the moment where the stadium erupts and really really helps drive the team on maybe scramble the opposition's mind somewhat and it just wasn't there and this is why it was so weird you mm. mentioned the applause you know muscle memory kicking in but it's like the, the applause felt very polite whereas the reaction to going 1-0 down was very like visceral you know suddenly the whole stadium woke up and yeah let's have a bit of that mm. have that arsenal and, and, and that sort of thing so it, it yeah it, the whole emotional dynamic was very bizarre and I think managers do talk about the fact that they can, you can feel the stadium, you can feel how a crowd responds to a certain moment, and at Spurs, it's just, it was just, just nothing there. Okay. On the subject of Ortega, uh, Duncan Alexander pointing out that there have been 15 goalkeeper substitutions in the Premier League this season. How many have been Edison? 
going out four. for Ortega? Four, four of so 15. Coin, coin yeah. the role yeah. as the yeah. injury prone goalkeeper. He's like Solskjaer, he just sits there studying the game and then comes on and, yeah. and but, makes yeah. an impact. But he's, he comes oh. across very well, Ortega. Like, yeah, he, like and he's and very like bright. He might and be off because. Is he? Yeah, because he wants more first team opportunities. He's 32, 33. He's not young. Yeah. He's. And for they, a goalkeeper, though. Yeah. Yeah, but. I, and also, very. Spe- I, I don't know, again, like. Um, uh, Guardiola after the game sort of paid, uh, you know, um, thanked his sort of goalkeeping staff for finding this guy because they got mm. him in from like Arminia Bielefeld. I mean, mm. it wasn't like a goalkeeper mm. from a top club or anything, but stylistically, they clearly saw something at him that he can come in and fit in into very, this very peculiar style yeah. that City play. Uh, and then obviously coming on as a sub, making three crucial saves in, you know, championship winning game. Just on the atmosphere though as well, I think mm-hmm. City looked a li- for the first, and I mean, they're normally this kind of robotic operation that's impervious to pressure and human emotion but they yeah. actually looked a little bit like they were aware they were in a title race for yeah. like the yeah. first time Kent in months. saying serving to win at Wimbledon is the hardest <laughs> shot of all. It's funny he makes that analogy because mm-hmm. I've thought this t- this title race to me has felt very Tennessee. It's felt like the final set mm-hmm. when you're a breakdown. If you're Arsenal you're a breakdown against a big server and you hold serve i.e. you win your games but then they just keep holding their serve really comfortably and winning their mm. games. And it's this kind of hopelessness that each time you win or hold your serve, and you're like, right. okay, this could be the one. Let's get the break. And then they just come and hold to love. Yeah, the joy of the oh. tennis analogy is the closest. What, what we'll probably have a seat of Man City and court action. But, was, so. Very yeah. good, yeah. Well, Duncan, sorry. Yeah, no, I do, to Charlie's point, I do a classic Eccleshire tennis analogy, nice. Um, but also, I, I do think the City will be nervous on... On Sunday against West Ham, mm. yeah, I feel like they maybe this was the one and they got through it, and then they'll go back to. But we come saw the Villa game mode. two seasons ago. But that's an outlier, isn't it? Like I know they like to present as like, oh, we like to make it difficult for ourselves. Like you don't really. You like to win it but by twenty points. They have given up a lot of xG recently, like against Forest. Even you know, it, I don't know. I I just feel like this this season. It's been this, eighteen months since a visiting team won at the Etihad. A draw though would be enough. I just I feel. That, this season's still got something left in it. There's something, oh. something's cooking. Wow. I forecast... A lasagna. <laughs> a lasagna. <laughs> I forecast David Moyes' final game in charge mm. to be a remarkable championship race-busting wide-open draw at the Etihad with Arsenal simultaneously going behind it <laughs> against Everton. I mean, that, How? The, the funniest thing to happen would be, would be City dropping points against uh, West Ham and Arsenal failing to beat Getting Everton. Sean Dyche. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nil-nil. Um, nil. I, I I do I cannot believe that there was something would happen for the reason I went to see City at Fulham on oh. Saturday. Mm. It was just clinical. It was mm. just uh, just a masterclass in controlling the opposition. They gave up. I was asking you has it ever happened before? They gave up zero chances. So basically, Fulham couldn't create anything. <laughs> um, and they they scored with their first possession. And I think it was interesting to see again against Fulham to settle down. What does City need to do? Score the ball for two minutes. And after that, they're absolutely fine. And I think this is perhaps what they kind of struggled to do a little bit against Spurs because Spurs kind of were up against them, up and at them. And, you know, they were switching formations. And talking of how they were playing against Spurs, I think it was very, I, think, I thought they, they felt very careful. They're mm. literally the thing, the thing got to them. Um, but I really cannot see this happening against West Ham. How many times has Moyes beaten the top four, like a big four away from home? Probably. Well, he, well, he did it for the this first season. Time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. That was the, yeah. And if that makes the difference in the title, yeah. it's extraordinary. Yeah. Amazing. That Amazing. will, ultimately. I mean, so, I do wonder mm. which, which game Arsenal, for if, as we assume Arsenal don't win the title, which game they will kind of think back on as the one. I don't think it's the Villa home game because Villa are a good team. I well, think Fulham was one. Was that a Fulham lot of both games. Like, yeah. Fulham drawing against. Te- so Arsenal were 2 1 up against 10 man. And Fulham Joe in Paulina, August mm. and Paulina scored from mm. a set piece okay but but there's also the I think was it Boxing Day the oh no New Year's Eve maybe the, they lost at Fulham they lost at yeah Fulham, they only yeah. picked up a point against Fulham if they picked up and three from the two games to, to and then the Newcastle VAR game will... yeah but I also think the sense I get is that there aren't that many regrets because if you get 89 points mm. like you, you, you are just going to drop points over the course of a season and you know, they've won, what, 15, drawn one but of the last 17. They've won more games than any Invincible. league season yeah. since 1970-71. Yeah. And yeah. yet still not good but enough I mean, because that's the world yeah. we live in. Uh, People will bring, you know, other discourses to that, those statistics. And, you know, they're all valid. I mean, people say now you, you need to get 90 points to compete. And it, they, if if they'd have got one more point, yeah. they will win the league on goal difference. So, wow. But they... Or two more. Because oh, yeah, they're yeah, too... Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think the, the they did they lost three out of five games in December, and it, it always felt like that they needed to 
kind of take advantage of the fact that City mm. tend to be a bit more vulnerable in the first half of the season. But then the fact that Arsenal have been... I mean, Arsenal, since the, every game this calendar year has been basically like drop points throughout the title race. They played Palace in January after the winter break and it was like, drop points here, it's done. So they've been playing every game and they've won basically every game. So, yeah, I don't think they can have... If they get 89 points, I don't think they can have too many regrets. Well, I mean, basically, welcome, welcome to our club yeah. from a few years yeah. ago. So, I mean, we know the feeling, but I think the... Um, I, I don't think Arsenal honestly can have regrets over this because the run, as you said, mm. you know, 15 wins in 17. It's like it's One almost... A, a City. Uh, exactly. Yeah, right. It's almost impossible. Maybe they could look at the City game with a bit of regret thinking, draws yeah. enough. Right. But that was with nine games to go. Yeah. So, but then you're up against City. So there's a lot of things going into it. Let's talk about some people who are unhappy, or at least were, on Tuesday night. Rodrigo Bentancur, absolutely... Furious, lashing yeah. into the the, the, yeah. the chair there. What, the what was that chair. about? I think he. I mean, he's he's had a really frustrating time. Like he uh, did his ACL last February, came back end of October. In November, got an injury straight away in a game he was playing brilliantly in. And ACLs are obviously really complicated and hard to recover from. He's had to be taken off early in games, even when he's been playing well, just mm. to manage him. And this was another one. He was playing brilliantly. He was also on a booking, so he couldn't foul Foden. In the lead up to that goal, had he not been on a booking, he just would have made the tactical foul. And I think all of that, that frustration of I'm finally back playing well, but I've been taken off because I'm on a booking and I'm not deemed fit enough to play, you know, a full game yet. Even though he, I'm sure in his mind, because throughout his recovery and his comeback, he was always, you know, saying, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. And they had to be like, you know, just take your time. So I think all of that built up. Fair enough. And then the other fellow, of course, is Ange Postecoglou. Mm. With his uh, snippy post-match performance, yeah. uh, fragility inside and outside this club, maybe I didn't realise, uh, and other words to that mm. effect. It was quite con that. Maybe I didn't realise it was quite Conte esque. Mm. You know, mm. maybe maybe this is me. Maybe I just you know I yeah I didn't realise how big a job. But he did I follow had. that up by saying, "But that's okay. That's what I'm here for." Yeah. It wasn't like I didn't realise. So no, 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 no. Um, mm. But it was surprising. The whole thing has been surprising, starting from his pre-match. So this relates to the large body of opinion, even within the Spurs kind of management structure, or at least backroom staff, that they'd be quite happy with defeat against Man City on Tuesday. Yeah, so we've done a piece, or we did a piece for yesterday, kind of explaining, because he did that thing of dropping this bomb, but then being like, but I'm not going to explain what I mean. But mm. I think it's that in any club... Bear in mind, there are a lot of people who work for the club who support the club as well. Hmm. And it's not been an, an explicit, um, or generally anyway, an explicit, you know, people are sensible enough not to know that going up to Posta Coglu and saying, like, go on, mate, drop the, you know, throw this game is not going to go down well. Hmm. It's been more little things that have been have said in the background, and he's picked up on this vibe of, you know, wouldn't it be funny if we lost this game? From people, I think, you know, and it's one thing the fans, hmm. but I think he's been horrified was yeah kind of how someone described to me by this sense that you know it's it, it wouldn't be the end of the world if we lost this game and we you know we don't want Arsenal to win the title I think he just thinks it's an incredibly small time mentality and has really uh ha has taken him by surprise I think mm. all righty what was it like for him in Glasgow then yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, it's, yeah but then Glasgow were always competing for titles so like yes he would be aware of the huge rivalry but, you know, Celtic, when Celtic are winning everything, then, you know, wanting your rivals, they, they wouldn't have been in a position where they're, like, you know, happy to lose games. Mm. So, but, but many Spurs fans are pointing out that, you know, Spurs have been a bit insipid in, in recent weeks. And, you know, where was, where was that passion then? You well, know? that's where... So there's this uh, image, this video went round of him uh, getting really angry with the fan. Mm. And we've been told that what, what actually happened, rather than what was suggested was that the fan was saying to him throw the game yeah we've been told what actually happened was the fan was saying to him like yeah where was this passion against arsenal right the fan was subsequently ejected which yeah. seems a bit hard yeah but i think it yeah i think there's been a build up jump on him yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no and fans you know and we include this in the piece a lot of fans are really upset about this they feel that it's a kind of misunderstanding of the rivalry and mm. the level of hate and all of that that exists between these two clubs so it has uh, it's been a bit of an issue all right well 2-0 defeat one which means that Spurs could actually drop even out of fifth place on the final day Sash anything you want to add about Man City 
Yeah, I thought for me, I mean, obviously we spoke about Ortega earlier as, you know, the guy who's saving their bacon, but I thought Foden was excellent throughout. Right. Um, I thought City, again, Bernardo Silva showed, you know, how tactically flexible and smart he is when they were switching formation to 4-4-2. But Foden for me, because he goes in on, I think it was Romero to, for, for a 50-50 the really ball pops up. Romero doesn't yeah. clean him out. Exactly. So they, they clash. Then ball pops up, controls it brilliantly on yeah. the run, puts it across, and then obviously he creates the goal. And also for the penalty at the end, the left-footed yeah, pass. pass yeah, oh, the weight of yeah. it. Like, oh my God. Yeah. And then everything else he did in the game as well, including missing an early chance. But yeah. I thought Foden in that game showed, you know, like that's I mean, he, that what he is basically. This season has player. been a real, real step forward. Mm. For, he's gone from promising to like, so like elite. Yeah. Punishing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look forward to him getting eight minutes at the Euros. <laughs> but it does sort of show there, I mean, the fact that we're talking about City about to win the fourth title is such an afterthought. It's mm. kind of telling, I mean. Well, I think there's been ample opportunity to explore what makes this City team great. Or some of the things that make the City team great, as I say, a lot of people who are not City fans will say there are a number the, of factors that don't get discussed enough. The only but, thing, like mm. a lot of people are saying, oh, it's unprecedented that, you know, it is unprecedented the team's going for a fourth title in a way, but that this has never happened before, that people have kind of lost interest and are bored. But I remember when United won their third in a row in 2001, 2001. everyone, because Arsenal were the only real challengers mm -hmm. then, and they'd been really bad, and mm -hmm. everyone was like, well, football's over, United are going to win it forever. And it doesn't work like that. No, um, but I do think part of the reason why fans and I wrote about this, uh, like fe the, the kind of schadenfreude and laughing at rivals, yes, that's always been a part of football. Right. I do think part of the reason it's now so central and paramount is because that's kind of all fans have when knowing that City are going to win the league every season. Mm. So this kind of this is kind of how most fans get their joy is their rival's misfortune, which is why City, no one really hates City and actually quite appreciates the job they do in denying Arsenal or Liverpool or whoever it is. Like they're kind of this quite useful vehicle for a lot of fans. For denying your rivals sporting yeah. success. Yeah, that's genuinely mm. like, which well is a really... City. No, I know, it's like a really bleak outlook, but that kind of is where we are right now. Mm. And all I, right. And I would, I, would, I would say that, like, I'm quite sympathetic towards Arsenal and, and all those of lovely Arsenal fans, but amongst, there is a feeling under all that is... If Liverpool don't beat City, then kind of don't want anyone else to beat well, City. Exactly. That's just, I, I, and I feel I feel so be, wrong. But yeah, I really it would be very painful for Liverpool fans to see Arsenal pull it off after getting ninety seven well, points it, and it, not. Plus, yeah. on top of that, it's like how how dare you win the league with ten points fewer? Exactly. Uh, no, I remember this last season because yeah. if, if, if one <laughs> if one team should hate City, right. it should be Liverpool. Yeah. And I remember this last season that Liverpool fans saying, "No, we want City to win because we feel Arsenal have had it easier against them than what we did." So it's like. It, which is yeah it's, it's like menta menta like the, I, I don't know i think someone should write a psychological paper on this the mentality <laughs> the mentality of this situation because it's not looking at it maybe from from before it's like i, I wouldn't necessarily find myself in this position That's but then why I, the italians call uh, supporters tifosi <laughs> yes. typhus sufferers basically what all they yeah. are yeah yeah but no, we should yeah. also point out there's this slightly nonsense um assertion generally that city have got no fans and all that stuff which is you know got no fans yeah <laughs> well so raider is much yeah. down um apparently goes to newcastle games now weird um but um the you know city when they're in league 1 equivalent they sell out every single game they they've got an incredibly loyal fan base and mm. this idea that just because they don't have a uk fan base as big as arsenal liverpool or united mm. um it shouldn't there are reasons that maybe the title wins can be devalued, but not not on a support basis. Mm. All right. We'll talk about the race for the other European positions and the other midweek football next. Wednesday night, anyway, uh, we had two more games. Uh, Chelsea are pulling within range of fifth-place Purs with their 2-1 win at Brighton. And Man United moving level with Newcastle on points, but behind on goal difference after uh, entertaining an expectation-busting 3-2 at Old Trafford. As it stands, Man United are 8th, Newcastle United are 7th, and Chelsea are 6th, and the team in 6th place will go into the Europa Conference wow. League unless Man City win the FA Cup, in which case that 6th place spot will be converted into a proper Europa League place. And if if sixth gets the Europa League place, then the Conference League place will go to seventh, it, which could be where Man United is. So will they be playing no, against I, themselves to? <laughs> <laughs> They'll be in both. I think. Don't need to back in that game. Yeah. 
Um, I think United are probably in a good spot now because they won last night, nice. Yep. But they have hugely inferior goal difference to Newcastle, so mm. they're eighth. So I think from United's point of view, they'd probably rather win the Cup and be Europa League or not be in Europe at all. Cup gets you Europa League? Yeah. Perfect. Man United are at Brighton. Chelsea hosting Bournemouth, Newcastle at Brentford. How much should we read into Man United's 3-2 win over Newcastle on Wednesday? Um, well, they looked good in parts. I mean, they had sort of Bruno as a, a false nine, yeah. which which worked quite well. I mean, the last two games, they have been a bit more secure. Um, I know, you know, they let him three goals in those games, but it does make you wonder whether, if they'd have done this a bit a few weeks earlier, whether they'd be in a, a slightly better position. Mm. But, um, yeah, it was a, I think it was quite a, a, a better than expected way for them to finish off their home campaign. You know, there, there was no leaks, there was no rain, um, and they got a win. <laughs> and, you know, the good. bar is well helped. Yeah, <laughs> you know, there was not much. What we can say is it didn't rain. <laughs> yeah. They only conceded twice. They got a, a terrific, absolutely terrific uh, first Premier League goal from Amagiallo as mm. well. Mm. Love that. Thumb My favourite kind, yeah. kind of half volley and with the ball goes absolutely arrow straight. And you can see the video from behind. You can yeah. just see how well he hits it. Goes nice. Uh, people pointing out him occupying Anthony's role in the team and matching Anthony's goal tally for the season in 21 fewer games. So that's good. What else impressed you? Uh, Gordon, as always. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, again, you know, the, um, the penalty incident was... I think everyone went on about the penalty. Yeah. He stamped on his Achilles. Yeah. That hurts. On a day in which we heard that the Premier League mm. will be discussing whether to have VAR or not, VAR yeah. doing a pretty good job of, of <laughs> job for it. Yeah. Convincing and and the I names. thought um, I actually quite in, I, I enjoy like listening to Gordon talk because I think he actually talks quite well after the right. game. And he, he was, was pretty punchy, wasn't yeah, he? And he? But he was he didn't really mess around. He just went, well, yeah. But and I thought it was interesting as well. I said I didn't go men, you know crazy sell like jumping to the ref penalty penalty because yeah. I thought you know VAR would see that and it's a penalty because I think he was like he got nudged and he got st stamped on and then he was like oh they're not giving it huh what's the point then and mm, I think yeah. it was a very pretty, very good argument. He's pretty eloquent actually. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people because of the way he left Everton mm. kind of was, but he's and not just last night recently he's been speaking really well I think. Mm. And also, but the way he's been playing as well for yeah, me yeah. one of the biggest surprises of this he's of been this great season. and a great winner of penalties mm. generally. Mm. But did you see one didn't get given it to him at the weekend where he did his thing of stepping in front of the kicker didn't give it well, to him. Well yeah we pointed it out the other week and might have scuppered his yeah. uh, <laughs> his pro bad process. <laughs> Mm. Rasmus Hoyland with the winning goal, well, what turned out to be the winning goal, Lewis Hall then pulling one back uh, to make it 3-2 afterwards. But, uh, yeah, lots of positives then for, for Man United. What about Chelsea's victory over Brighton? Hmm. Chelsea are in good form. Like yeah. they are for, for a reasonably sustained period. And of all the teams who, I mean, everyone's kind of wanting to be, you know, looking at them and thinking, are we on a kind of Arsenal trajectory? They, they at least... I feel this has been. This will end up being a fairly p promising season in some ways, especially given all the injuries they've had. I mean, they have missed a lot. I know United have as well. Mm. But at least Chelsea, I feel like, have a bit more of a plan and look like they, well, in a playing sense anyway. Like they, they, look, they look like they're developing patterns in a way of playing in a way that just doesn't seem to be the case at United. Uh, again, like Spurs, one or two worrying noises from the manager after yeah. the game. Yeah, yeah. That, that 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 is. I mean, I personally, I think it would be really strange to make a change, a managerial change, given given the progress. Yeah, given their progress and like what it just I feels mean, like an, it would be a step back. That I don't think they're going to get anyone better. I mm. mean, it's it's quite interesting slash chilling to see United and Chelsea approach the top six because it's like regression to the mean of you know everyone talked about the big six and Chelsea and were marooned in mid table for most of the season. And actually, if you look. Um, the you know if you want to call it the I don't know the great eight you know the big eight essentially as it is now <laughs> they're going to finish well clear I mean United are in eighth and they're they're five points clear of West Ham and that that kind of section of the Premier League really feels set now. Mm. Um, Speaking of chilling, what, what, what about the amazing Cole Palmer who uh, opened up the scoring well, in this it. clash? Yeah, yeah well, Ronnie had it to, to yeah, control that. I mean, it yeah. was fired in and he yeah. just glanced yeah. it over. Um, the keeper, it was, yeah, brilliant. I mean, 20, he's 27th goal of the season, that in all competitions. Numbers. 22nd in the Premier League. Is it where would he be in the discussions of player of the season? Not not Chelsea player of the season, in but the conversation, but Premier League. Yeah. He's a young player of the season, probably nailed on, isn't he? Mm -hmm. Um, who'd you have? Would you have your Phil Foden above him? 
Over is Phil, Phil Foden a young player anymore, or no, is I'm he actually a player? player? As a general, general. Uh, as a general fan, like I'm Phil Foden fan here, so yeah. I would have Foden there. Yeah. I mean, Rodri. Yeah, I was going to say Rodri. Mm. I mean, so Rod- the only reason we've got a title race is because Rodri was out. <laughs> yeah, missed a few games. Yeah, so. did, did good for everyone. <laughs> yeah, and one of the games he was suspended for was a League Cup game. If if that had been a, a Premier League game, who knows? Maybe that that was another. Yeah, that, yeah, was yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. that was the moment. That was the moment. The fixture calendar. <laughs> you play, wow. I think it was Newcastle. They played in the cup, which they did also lose. Yeah, they the lost one nil with that. Mm. So yeah. um, him or yeah, Rod- Rodri or Rice, I think would also be in Rice, Rice, yeah. the picture. Mm. Um, okay, uh, there you go. Uh, Christopher and Kunku also scoring in this, making it two one. Oh, and Reese James. Oh. Mm. Mm. Availabilities, miss... Reese James. <laughs> yeah, captain's performance. <laughs> oh, now we're talking about VAR. A lot of uh, Chelsea fans were extremely unhappy unhack- with Stockley Park's performance on the on, on another incident here. Reese James, there was a lengthy uh, analysis of the leg that he stuck out in a kind of Beckham fashion uh, at João Pedro to earn his sending off. But the incident when uh, Tarek Lamptey basically just goes over to Mudrick and sticks an elbow on him and. I think Mudrick had to have con- concussion treatment afterwards. It, um, yeah, it didn't get. It got a cursory glance. I think again, it, it just fuels that that yeah, suggestion of consistency narrative. Yeah, we'll talk more about VAR later on. Maybe consistency <laughs> slash common sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Petulance is always tended to be punished worse than mm. violence in football. Yeah. Is that right? Anyway, no, no, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, it's why you'd you'd rather have your leg broken than be spat at. I exactly. Think, you know, that's, that's, that's the, same kind of the time, football logic. The worst that can- <laughs> Thinking. That would be brutal. Yeah. Insult to injury, quite literally. Although spit Brighton, is technically, uh, medicinally functional. So. I'm just going <laughs> to ignore that. Thank you. <laughs> Brighton, Brighton, here's a stat. Only the bottom four have collected fewer points than the Seagulls since the turn of the year. Ooh. Anyway, Brighton are who's going to be facing Man United this weekend, while Chelsea will host Bournemouth in what is Chuggo Silva's last game for Chelsea. It's not an easy game, that, given... The form that Bournemouth themselves have had this season. The reverse fixture in September, 27 shots, no goals. Interesting. Seagulls will be hosting Man United this weekend, against whom they've won their last four Premier League meetings. I sort of hope they win by five goals against Manchester United. Ooh, because, because if they do, they will end on 13 wins, 12, 12 draws, 13 defeats, and a goal difference of zero, which mm. I think is the most perfect satisfying w- mid-table yeah. season. And, and Back also, to where you started. It would set an extraordinary new figure uh, for any future team to try and beat in terms of goals conceded. Yeah, very mm. much so. Simultaneously on Sunday, Newcastle will travel to Brentford. Ivan Tony's last game, that quite possibly for the Bees. He hasn't scored in his last 11 matches. The Bees have never beaten the Magpies in the Premier League. And then you've got Chelsea up against Bournemouth in Thiago Silva's last game for Chelsea. Potentially Bournemouth with a top half finish. Remarkable stuff from the remarkable Iraola. Hmm. Good Lord. All right. Well, we'll see how it all plays out for fifth, sixth, seventh, and, and eighth. Uh, but we know that Villa are top four now. We're on to that game and all that it entailed next. Yeah, wild times at Villa Park on Monday. Aston Villa three, Liverpool also three. Tom Hanks was there. So was <laughs> Sasha. One of them uh, gives us now his thoughts. Sasha, it's you. Oh, <laughs> sorry. So sorry, listeners. Um... Well, what, a, what an interesting start to this game. That uh, Emmy Martinez... Um, yeah. own, own goal. <laughs> a moment of silence from everybody, including the Villa analysts next to me, I think, as everyone tried to figure out, what did you just yeah. do, man? What did he just do? Hard one to analyse. <laughs> but Well, I, rain, like it did start raining about quite heavily uh, before the game. But I think, so I think as Elliot comes in, puts the ball across, takes a slight deflection, hmm. which perhaps changes the way the ball's spinning. Right. So Martinez adjusts. Mm. And it effectively just goes through his hands and squirms out. And he, well, as, he, he to then tries to rescue yeah, he's it. Yeah, rescue, but it's, it's, des- it's the, the desperate, bit, the yeah, it's yeah, the yeah, desperate no, bit. No, I think it's already rolling in. I don't yeah, I know if he pushes he, it in. He pushes it in. But it's, it's already going in. And I think his, that reaction as a goalkeeper, having f***ed up, basically, mm. is not very controlled. Mm. You're mm. just trying to sort of get to the ball. Uh, I think it was described in commentary as a rare mistake from Emmy Martinez. Yeah. But Duncan... 
The well, numbers say something different. He now leads the Premier League ever for own goals by goalkeeper. So. But two this season, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one of those is the, the classic hits the post. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. All right. He's on top of that chart. Villa are in the top four of the Premier League standings and it will thus be in the new look Champions League next season. 41 years since they last competed in that competition. Last game against Juventus. Uh, they lost 3-1 and some I, I actually looked up the goals today some bad goalkeeping and defending in that one <laughs> um, <laughs> bit of heritage yeah exactly quarterfinals uh, European Cup 1983 but, but this game here against yeah. Liverpool the, beyond Martinez yeah. I mean, it was bonkers it, and brilliant it, it, it was it was it's very end of season feel to it mm. um, so I think you know afterwards you know, people saying ah oh, Liverpool threw away to go lead they made a quadruple sub um, also I thought overall um, Liverpool it was one of those games where a two-one up, you're thinking, well, the Liverpool um, are getting a lot of marginal decisions going their way, basically, in, t- in terms of the game state, in terms of VAR, because we were looking at the VAR on the first goal, and everyone was convinced that is offside, and it somehow was on, and people are like, well, what can you see with your open eyes? After a really lovely move where Liverpool build it up, and they have a um, switch of play from Salah and two players running on in the back stick, and eventually Gakpo slides it in. Really nicely constructed goal, but... Again, that VAR decision was marginal. So I was thinking about that. And then uh, was it Diego Carlos misses from mm, yeah. a foot out of XG.99. And I w- I've looked at it again and again. And One I have, of the biggest misses uh, in Premier League history. It is, definitely. It was, it, that felt, that, that, that mm. felt historical. Like, it was unbelievable. The only thing I would, like, that makes it not like one of the absolute worst is that it does come to him at... It's not like it's relatively fast. It's yeah. relatively fast. It <laughs> yeah. It's not like sort of trickling over and he mm. somehow misses it. But obviously, hmm. it's bad. But it, it, that was an extraordinary one. But I think also just before the end, the three one up, uh, the ground's pretty dead. Uh, Liverpool are cruising towards a victory, and then I think that what we saw is quite symptomatic of basically tightness and tightness in midfield from McAllister. Uh, mm. It's just a very very tight piece of play from him. Duran jumps on, and again, you know, t- talking of luck and football, the only reason Duran's on is because Daniel gets injured. Um, mm. so it, w- it wasn't an intentional substitution or anything a few minutes before and Duran's fresh and then after that talking of a feeling in the stadium the whole place goes absolutely nuts and they're all urging Villa forward come on guys get some more and then they get the third which was like jammy as you like <laughs> I mean just on the run hits the player's knee and, and then they could have got a fourth and they could have no, got a fourth but at this stage the stadium like that goal and after 2-3 the whole stadium was going nuts to an extent I was like don't really need to win this, but like they're all going absolutely insane. But which Last is why, as well, to your mm. point before, James, about how you know, fans are mm. mad. Yeah. But there is a logic. Like when you're a fan and you're mm. watching a game and your team's two goals up and you're pacing the room mm. because you're like, but if we can see now, yeah. it's all going to go and you look like a maniac. You're saying it's a dangerous league. <laughs> it's a dang- <laughs> but it can be. You know, it does just show that there's a reason that why we are all so mad because a game like this happens when, you know, I'm sure Liverpool fans all would have been really nervous mm. despite. As a neutral watching that game as well, I'm like, this is petering out, this is going nowhere. But then Mm -hmm. something happens and all of a sudden it all changes. Who'd be a football fan? Exactly. Who'd be a football fan? Uh, I imagine, are you going along to Wolves? Yeah, I'll I'll be going along to Wolves. As you ring the last drop of Klopp Liverpool. Why did Liverpool play Wolves at the last day? I know, why always us? But then Arsenal have played Everton quite a few. Like Mm. I was thinking about this, there must be some... That fix your computer. Yeah, that fix your computer. It must be to do with like, certain teams are always at home at the Mm. end. So like, there's there probably is a reason you have these repeat fixes. Of, Of Wolves' last six visits to Anfield, three of them, Fully 50% had been on the final yeah. day. Maybe they were just, they looked at it, they knew about Klopp and they just plunked it in there. As, you know, Is that Klopp the game heritage. you'd want? Uh, sorry? Is that the game you'd want for a Klopp send-off? Uh, not necessarily. <laughs> <but> Reminder <laughs> of the <laughs> league's not won in no, years No, but the, I think the big difference in the previous seasons and the big difference I think to what's happening with Arsenal, mm. last day when Liverpool were playing Wolves in 2019 and 2022, they still had a Champions League final to come and that definitely changes the mood right, somewhat. Um, right. Not happening this time, just the no. farewell to Klopp. Uh, just the farewell to Klopp. I was actually moved, very moved when uh, Klopp went over to the way and to wave, wave goodbye and bow to the people. I was like, I, w- I was saying something on camera and I was like, give me a minute. Um, so, yeah, it's... Um, Sash, what, what, what's it going to be like on Sunday? I think it's going to be lots of tears. I had I some mean, tears yesterday just listening to stuff about it. Um, I hope. I what, think. I what think, did you What did you hear yesterday that triggered those? I was, just, I was just reading, and I was just I was listening to. His, he was doing like some fun interviews, and I was listening to Danfield Rap, and they had a chat with Klopp, and um, and you know, it's a lot of these things you've heard before, right? Um, and but they, he, I think, I think the big thing with Klopp when he came in. Um, at the time at Liverpool is just he was so comfortable in his own skin. Mm. He was like, 
he came in and into a very depressed fan base. The club going, the players not playing very well. And then immediately Lallana goes, whoa, I like this guy. And first game was against Spurs. Yeah. And I always use the Spurs nil -nil. matches in the nil-nil. Nothing really changes apart well, from ran Lallana on. running like a maniac. Yeah. And I was like, whoa, okay, so th th this is interesting. And clearly... Was it him who fell into Klopp's <coughs> arms when he came off? It's him or Milner, one possibly, of those Yeah, one of those, yeah. Like, but it was... It was so the, 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 it was the... the yes, it was actually the 5-4 right. at Norwich? The 5-4 yeah. at Norwich. Yeah. With glasses go flying, everyone yeah. jumps on but top it's of the, it. But it's those moments, when I think Klopp spoke about this. It spills that togetherness. Like, we have this... It might be just the 5-4 at Norwich, but... Right. It's it's a gradual process of coming together, which well, possibly West Brom yeah. home draw, yeah, which everyone laughed at. Yeah. But the thing is, again, that's not the point. It's like, <laughs> guys, you stay behind. You know, we'll give this to you. But I, and I think what really helped the first season, it culminated in the four three against Dortmund. Yes, which mm -hmm. was again, it was the first time because I, I was on the cop that night, and I have managed to convince myself. And again, this is how I think this collective psychosis works. As long as Liverpool only need three goals, we're still in this. I don't know. This has absolutely no logic. But I was mm. when Dortmund go three one up. You still think we're still kind of in it. And then they gradually, because I was thinking, you get a goal here, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. Mm, and right. it kind of works out that way. And that night, and I think Klopp referenced it, no Barcelona, that would have been the night, the European nights. Okay. Of all the European, mm. more than the Barcelona game? If, if Barcelona hadn't happened. Oh, sorry. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. Then, then Were you the there Dortmund. for Barcelona? Yes, I was there for Barcelona. Again, so the thing with Barcelona, by that stage, Liverpool have kept uh, up with City, um, winning um, game after game after game. The European run that season uh -huh. almost felt as a bit of an afterthought until Liverpool win 3-1 away to Bayern Munich when suddenly everyone goes, whoa, mm -hmm. this is serious because everyone's so focused on the league at, at that stage. Then, th then Liverpool keep winning and they, they lose 3-0 at the Camp Nou and they, they play fantastically yeah, well. They did, not they they did like, and they could have lost 4-0. Yeah, they had chance yeah, the end they had chance that. But you, you go look at that and you go, there was a 15-minute spell with Liverpool were actually unplayable at the company. And they lose 3-0. It's like, what, what's going on? Then they go to Newcastle. And of all those unheralded games that people remember, for me, Newcastle is the one. Newcastle away doesn't mean anything oh, for yeah. them, but they're all up for it. Rondon they're is, like, ridiculous. They win it late, don't they? They win it. Salah gets injured. And everyone's thinking back to Kiev. Oh, my God. So, um, so Salah is carried off. Origi comes on. And Origi scores that header off his shoulder, head, whatever it was. <laughs> and then something else on much of this. There's about 12 minutes of injury time. And the eruption at the end of that was extraordinary. And I think that kind of kept the feeling going we're unbeatable. Right. Because remember, then we watched the, the City game at uh, Jazz FM downstairs. Oh, yeah. And they get the late winner. And it's like, it's, and how would Liverpool react? But I think because of the Newcastle game, despite the injuries, you know, Firmino Salah was out. There was something about Barcelona where you're thinking, maybe that there is still something. I didn't really believe it. But 10, 15 minutes before the game, suddenly it gets quite full. Suddenly everyone goes, yeah. And I think there was a sense of... Not relaxation, but there was something is, yeah, let, 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 let's do this. And then they get an early goal. Yeah. And then it just builds up and up and up and up. And then at the end of it, it's like the most perfect comeback game, everything. I think it was a stronger performance than Istanbul, for example, because... Until the more night yeah. and uh, Spurs beat. Well, 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 you <laughs> could say, crazy. but the thing is, but at that stage, uh, coming off the pitch as well, because Liverpool felt, I th without, I think, any arrogance, stronger than Spurs or Ajax. We thought, okay, this, this, is, this time we'll get it back because this was the greatest hurdle. This was the, and it was, it was an extraordinary experience. Yeah, you've had so many extraordinary mm. experiences in this, what is it now, nine, year, nine eight, years? Nine, yeah. eight, yeah. nine, eight and a half, yeah. yeah. And this is the thing that, um, obviously we've known that he's, he, he made the announcement earlier in the year, but the way that the, the football is, there's always something happening. There's a big story. He says this, that's the dominates the cycle for a couple of days. So you know about it, but you don't really have a chance. You're too busy with everything else that's happening until you start getting to the end of the season, which I imagine is happening to you right now, Sash, and you start realizing, holy cow, this is the fourth longest serving manager in the Premier League era. This is a man who, beyond having been at Liverpool, for a long time, has identified with the club, has represented a different style of being a manager tactically, but also away from the pitch, the way he addressed social issues, the way he spoke, the authority with which he spoke out about really important issues, just his whole manner of being. This is an absolutely seismic change to the Premier League landscape, which uh, it might be recency bars, but I would put it up there with Sir Alex leaving Manchester United. I, I, think, I think it is as significant as that because, and again, he is this huge figure. He is the sort of figure... Figurehead and well, the manager of the club that went up against City to make to make things mm. a little, that that bit more interesting. Again, people would argue, you know, what about, what about the trophies? What about the ride, man? 
It's mm. like, you know, getting getting to those 97, 99. On, on, for trophies, he is, I think, on par, I think, with Shankly, I think, with about six well, or seven. Well, how many managers tried to get Liverpool back into it? Yeah, it, 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 that was, and that was, that was, that, there were moments um, when Liverpool got close and then fell away. But I also think with Klopp, it got to a stage in 2018, 2019 where it felt inevitable. And what a feeling. For a year, Liverpool won every game. Like, I mean, it's it, just, it's it, just it, it, it was insane. Was they went on a 100, run. 106 points out of 118 or something. Yeah. Yeah. Not 108. So they had one draw oh, yeah, in yeah. 36 games, which was a, a Lalana. It's got equalizer at Old yeah, Trafford. United, yeah. And it's, 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 it's an extraordinary. They're not winning that 18 19. I mean, 97 points is just. But, they but, won 30 games. They lost one. It's just. I mean, it, it, ah, it's it, just ludicrous. It, it, but the thing is, ludicrous situation. You lose the title last day of the season, but you still have that European Cup. And I think we did a port afterwards, and I was thinking. I know it sounds ridiculous, but they'll get better, <laughs> and they did. And yeah. it, it's, it's what a feeling of their journey. Um, so and then th- come back that following season yeah. and win the first what twenty odd league. Apart uh, from that draw with United, it uh, yeah, was, it was uh, they lost eventually at Watford, which yeah. I went to where Deeney got into uh, Loblaws Grill. But uh, yeah, it but was an extraordinary yeah. start though that following season. I mean, it's the greatest start ever. ever I think I mean, yeah. it'll yeah. never be matched ever. Yeah. It, okay. they, they blew away City. They broke City, which yeah. is no one, no one's yeah. done it before or since. So yeah. Um, and I think, and, and, and for Klopp to sort of, and I, I don't think this happens without Klopp because a manager of a similar ability and whatever else, but the personality. And I think mm. this was happened when he first walked into Liverpool, couldn't have thought of a more perfect fit. And I think that's what everyone felt at the time. And the buy was almost have immediate. That's what do with a club of that size. That's why Arteta kind of works at Arsenal, I think. So, mm. um, I mean, I guess the only b- bad thing about that season we just talked about was that Liverpool did win the league, but obviously... That's, you know, that's, that's the one thing I would change. Yeah. Yeah, have some fans. That, that was yeah. have some fans. Come on. That was um, so yeah. So it's, there's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of tears. Yeah, I mean, we're going to miss. Them. I can't imagine what mm. it's going to be like for it's the people at Anfield. And uh, yeah, when they start singing, you'll never walk alone at the start. It's, it's it's not going to be just that. I think it's yeah. I think I think it's, I'm prepared for being in floods of tears for about three hours. Basically, it's yeah. How much do we think Gary O'Neill is going to play up to it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> when did Daniel leave Liverpool? He, he was he, he was worked with Klopp at Liverpool. Yeah, it's recent enough, isn't it? Um, but yeah, is Gary Daniel going to be talking about VAR in the post match? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but we might be a little yeah, bit later on. Yeah, could be bidding an emotional yeah. farewell. Yeah, Liverpool that season won 26 and drew one of their yeah. first 27 games. Good lord, that is it's outrageous. And again, that's that season about people remembering the key games. Simon Hughes, you know, there was a little piece in the um, Athletic about you know the key matches. Uh, for Simon Hughes, it's the it's Villa yeah. away, yeah. one nil down until late on, week before you're playing City to keep that lead. And you know Robertson equalised minus scores ninety fourth minute, and that was a feeling. Yeah, they said we're breaking City here, and then was three one at Anfield the following week, and the title race was over. It's like ten games into the season. Incredible. All right, Sash, best of luck on Sunday. And next up, talk about a few more things, including that VAR business, and then we'll get onto the Inter totally. Well, it's the final day of the WSL season on Saturday. All games will be kicking off at 3 o'clock. Chelsea midweek had their game in hand against Spurs. And blow me if they didn't win 1-0 to go back top of the table on goal difference. Crikey. Uh, Man City are going to be, who's the team that they are level on points with, are at mid-table Aston Villa on Saturday. Chelsea, who have a two-goal lead in the goal difference, will be at FA Cup winners Man United in Emma Hayes's Final game in charge, so emotional scenes there as well. That's a great dynamic with both teams on the same points mm. and a slightly different goal difference, and it's what could have been the it case in the Premier have. League. That's what you could have had. That's so fun because knowing that it being in two teams' hands effectively. Yeah. I'm forward to that. Very nice. Uh, the Scottish Premiership title is in Celtic's hands after their 5 0 win against Kilmarnock. Mm. Mm. Uh, that happened on Wednesday night, Duncan. You know, I just heard someone on the radio this morning, a fan they interviewed, saying it was an incredible achievement. I was thinking... It's very credible. One of the two, <laughs> yeah. one of the two that I tipped at the yeah. start of the season. <laughs> yeah. uh, Juventus quite possibly would have been your prediction for the Coppa Italia victory. Uh, they duly sealed it Wednesday night with a 1-0 victory over Atalanta. It is the 15th time uh, they've won the Coppa. It's the fifth time that they've won it with... Uh, Max Allegri is their manager. It's probably one of his last games in charge, and this is second spell. Is Gasparini ever going to win anything? I don't know. Maybe next <sighs> Wednesday. Yes, that was it. Maybe next Wednesday, because, of course, Atalanta mm-hmm. are in the Europa League final on the 22nd against Bayer Leverkusen, who, thinking about it, don't really lose much, do they? 
Atalanta do lose much in the Coppa Italia. Some wild segues going on here. That's the <laughs> third time in six seasons that they've got to the big game. Oh, now also on Wednesday, football landscape was shaken to its very foundations with David Ornstein's scoop that the Premier League are going to be debating on June the 6th at their annual general meeting whether or not to scrap VAR from next season. Boom! We've seen Sweden voting not to bring it in. Now, the mighty Premier League voting whether to move it out. They would need a two-thirds majority of clubs to end the VAR experiment, which everybody's telling me, or which I read, is extremely unlikely. What do you think? Well, it'd be great if it happened. I also think... Um, Charlie says it would be great. <laughs> Duncan, you're not so sure. I I think it would be good, but then I also know for a fact within a month of next season, what? there'll be people highlighting no, no, this, referee mistakes. This is what I was going to say. I think the be- if, you're, if you are a VAR advocate, mm. almost the best thing would be to get rid of it because Ooh. we're all such children yes. that as soon as you got, we got rid of it, we would be like... Oh, but you've got to have it for that. We, Next we can't year's have AGM errors. would be bringing it back yeah, in again. Pr- pretty yeah, much. I mean, yeah. like we brought it in because we were children and complained so much, and I'm right. sure we would just do the exact same thing. I hope that they, but the, the Premier League uses it as leverage to sort of essentially say to PG MOL that to stop kind of having it as this kind of like, oh, we don't want upset the refs. You know, we mustn't like make the refs look bad. It should be a bit like Anthony Gordon was saying. It should be there as a check and balance against mistakes. Why? Well, so you you would like to keep it, but with modifications. Yeah, I think this idea of like high bar is, is nonsense because it means that that allows refs that they're, they're more. It feels like they're more worried about making their refereeing colleagues look bad by well, saying, we, "Oh, you we made." We know this. they are. I mean, Mike Dean explicitly yeah. Yeah. admitted this. You're more like the Champions League, where it's just yeah. I've yeah, not, you I've, made to go and look I've at not it. noticed it in the Champions League this season. It's, it's just operated as a you know. You thing. haven't? Not really. I mean, I, I do agree that it does seem especially lengthy in in the Premier League, which is weird because the first year they had it, the the biggest kind of priority for them was doing it as fast as possible, so they didn't send referees over to review the action that had already been reviewed. They just listened to what's said and then... But, sorry, Sash. I think they need to look at the whole dynamic of the VAR and main referee because I do think if a VAR is a junior referee telling the senior referee you made a mistake and clearly they take this quite personally, hmm. this dynamic has to stop. Maybe the two bodies have to be separated. But the yeah. one thing that I would say that I think they should have done this season and, which, and the, I think what they're doing next season, and I'm not sure whether this falls under the remit of VAR, semi-automated offsides. Well, here we go. Come I, on. Like, no, I mean, no, but they, they need to do that because yeah, we spent but, three you know words for you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they are magical yeah. words yeah. because when you hear them, you think, well, that's our problems over. There we are. But it really doesn't. It really doesn't. It's not as well. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, um, so I'm in favour uh, of using technology to improve refereeing, but only when it is like goal line technology, uh, something that is a true kind of game changer in that sense. Just using, just essentially delegating the decision to somebody in a room in, in Stockley Park, bunker. in a heated bunker. I don't think, I mean, my, my kind of analogy has always been that you can't, it's like doing an autopsy on a living patient if you stop the game mm. to break down everything. And it, it essentially kills kills what you were there to kind of and, and, to and, and, make yeah. better. But so I'm with Charlie on this. I would just get rid of VAR altogether. I do agree. We'd, we'd all be, I mean, in the championship, everyone's like, bring, champ, bring VAR in and are they... That's the thing. Like, you, but then I hope. I, w- I wonder if there'd be an element of like last time we didn't know what it was, and we mm. had this view it was going to be this panacea, and it was going to be omniscient ref bots, and everything yeah. would just work out brilliantly. Obviously, we know that's not the case now, so I wonder if it'd be different. But my suspicion is there would be a lot of. No, I, th- I think oh, we've actually got we used to. So I get really upset by VAR, but I've also got used to it going, getting correcting stuff that should have been corrected. But, but also I think they uh, highlighted the whole thing around, say, I don't know, handball rules. That it's for Guys, sort out your laws first yeah. and, then, and, then, and then blame it on the VAR. Ish, but I also mm. think what VAR has exposed is that football, a lot of it was just done on you kind of know when you see it mm. and that worked to an extent. Mm. Suddenly when it's like we freeze it, we're like, yeah. we're like, what is the rule? It's like, mm. uh, I don't really know. We sort of never really defined the handball law in 125 yeah. Rory, Rory years. It kind Smith of was. About, yeah. Yeah. It kind of vibes. was. Like, mm. you know, you just sort of, you kind of knew one where you saw one, and also and once it was well, given, if the guy's miles offside, fine. But if it's, I mean, I did if think. Think yeah, that, well, oh, yeah, that's <laughs> 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 offside is is a binary thing. Yeah, yeah offside right. I have less issue with. What I think is interesting but no, but people is that people do because it's semi automatic I know. Yeah. It's but, like, oh, but this player has right, so oh, yeah, 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 it's like, oh, but it would have been such a nice goal. They've got to let that happen. Yeah, can you? That's obviously crazy. I mean, that's it's a sport. It's artistic license. Can you have? 
semi-automated offside SAO. Sow. Uh, sow. Can you have that without VAR? Well, this is my In question. the same I way as GL GLT? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, oh. but, but possibly, but GLT works. In well, GLT's instead, wow. so... Yeah. It kept us the villa in the league in summer 2020, True. and now look at them. Mm. So, yeah. you know. Mm. Makes you uh, think. But, 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 but they're think. not going to vote to get it out, though, are they? Probably not. I mean, I've always wondered who oh, VAR is for, and I've never. And what I've always been told is that for managers generally who care less about, you know, atmosphere and not being able to celebrate goals, mm. for them they are in favour of it generally because there's no, you know, VAR has improved as much as you can quantify this, you know, correct decisions that are made. Th so if you are a manager, you do want to trust that you're not going to be screwed over by variants. I mean, one of the ideas for next season, if it if it still exists, is to have, a bit like in, in the NFL, have referees talking so people at the stadium can actually know. And which I, I, which I find... How good would that be? I think well, this is... I do think that if you're at a game when a VAR... Do you want to hear more from refs? I, we don't yeah. ever hear from them. <laughs> to be fair, we don't ever hear from them. So well, we hear from Howard Webb <laughs> and... And Michael Owen, yeah, yeah. on their, on their <laughs> program. But you know, I think it'd be quite, you know, you know, defense, ten yard penalty. What well, they're not, gonna say yeah. That. But you know what I mean? I think but that it's might like help. there was that clamor for like we want to hear refs come and explain their decisions, and yeah. all they would say and never do say is I gave it as I we've saw it Peter in the Walton, moment. We, and we've heard <laughs> Peter Walton or Mark calls in. It, it sort of raised more questions than it did provide yeah. answers. Mm. A Pandora's box. Yeah, I think we need to make them less the centerpiece than yeah. more. Yeah, would be my view. Okay. But, Oh, we, one, one last argument for the semi-automated stuff. Yeah. We're not going to spend three minutes looking at it like we did at Villa against Liverpool on the Liverpool goal. And if anything, if they want to put something that will save time. Mm. And w one of the main things we're talking about here, Stefan Rose, is how much VAR breaks up the play. Yeah. If it's 10 seconds instead of three minutes, I think I seem to yeah. be like the, it, would, it would have, have a different reaction to it. it so Certainly that's true. Mm. Uh, this weekend, Crystal Palace take on Aston Villa. We kind of didn't talk much about uh, Aston Villa and the fact that they are going to be in the Champions League. Did you see that remarkable clip of Sir Alex Ferguson back on yeah, the opening yeah. day talking to NBC mm. after Villa had just been roundly pumped by Newcastle yeah. and saying that actually they were the team that had impressed him most? He knows ball. The yeah. Yeah. The yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> he, he's finally shown. It's the he, thing everyone says he, about Ferguson. Yeah. 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 No, I do think with Villa, I just like... Given they were without Mings and Buendia the whole season mm. with ACLs, I mean, it's an incredible achievement. But given that context, and they've had lots of other injuries as well, it really is amazing they've done it. And I think maybe because they've kind of stumbled over the finish line, mm. that's been a bit diluted. And because it's felt just kind of inevitable because Spurs have dropped points recently. But it really is an incredible achievement. And I know it's been said a lot, but they were really struggling last season when Emery took over under Steven Gerrard. And and what's interesting is that, you know, they wanted Pochettino at that time as well. Mm. And I think Pochettino felt, you know, that it wasn't quite right for him. He'd wait for something bigger, which, you know, I guess you could argue came along in Chelsea. But ironically, but then mm. it's Villa getting top four and Emery is beloved there and Pochettino is still doing this slightly weird dance with the Chelsea fans. There's obviously Villa spent heavily in the late 2000s under Marcelo O'Neill to try and get Champions League football and they finished six for three years in a row and that basically kind of that overspending saw them mm. spiral out of the Premier League etc and it is it's been a yeah it's a, it is a, you know I've saw some people say it's the the most romantic story since Leicester I'm not sure that's quite mm. true but it is. Villa making top four. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the only thing you can say is we saw what happened to Newcastle this season, and that, and you know, with a with a non sort of title chasing squad, it is going to be hard, particularly with two extra group games next year as well with the new oh, format. Yeah, that's true. So, that's but true. I, but I think but they had Conference League this season, whereas mm. Newcastle last season had no yeah, Europe. True. Yeah, yeah. True. They will be taking on Crystal Palace this weekend in what should be a hugely entertaining game. You can watch mm. it if you're abroad. Uh, it's possibly the least consequential game of the fixtures on this final day because Sheffield United Tottenham that could have an impact on whether Spurs finish fifth or sixth Luton Fulham potentially if Luton were to win 12-0 <laughs> could see them stay up Burnley Forest if Forest were to lose 12-0 etc and so on but yeah Crystal Palace against Aston Villa should be an absolute banger the upgrade your manager Classico <laughs> yeah indeed so be careful what you wish for Classico <laughs> yeah yeah uh, we'll, we'll wait to see what happens in those uh, games uh, and we'll be, of course, reviewing them all on Sunday evening.
Uh, but right now, we'll finish off today's Totally Football Show with the Inter Totally Cup. Hey, listener, it's Inter Totally time. Woohoo! Now, already through to the semi finals, we've had Michael Cox, who knocked Charlie here out. Controversially, mm. eh, Charlie? A little bit. Yeah. Uh, Michael will be taking on Julian Laurence, housewife's favourite in one semi final. The other one will see Tom Williams, who knocked out Sasha, controversially, taking on whoever comes out of today's clash. So, with that in mind, let's meet our first contestant, producer Charlie, into today's, oh, this year's competition. Charlie, woo! Great oh, choice. Hello, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, lovely to have you here taking part in this. Competition which you've organised and you're going to edit. <laughs> That's yeah. how I won last year. <laughs> well, no, you won by dint of superior, <laughs> superior knowledge. How how has your year been as reigning into totally champion? Just yeah, yeah, constant sex, water, drugs, water and rock world. and roll. Yeah, yeah. I've really wow. gone off the rails. <laughs> really, yeah, really. Well, we'll see to what extent. But it hasn't changed you. That's what's so impressive. <laughs> Can you book yourself another year? The title defence starts here. Let's meet the man you're up against. Daniel Storey. Welcome to the competition. Thank you for having me. Lovely to hear the title of my autobiography. Look out for the sex <laughs> noises. Sex <laughs> noises. Indeed. Daniel, listener you will recall, was runner-up in 2020, but two years later won this competition. What a sweet moment that was, Daniel. Yeah, I still think about it now. It's, um, so yeah, it's do been I, a long Daniel. two years. A long two years. Well, Charlie, was it you who had beaten in that final? Very much so. Yeah. Good there was, Lord. There was a question on, was it a question on Arsenal that you got wrong, that you killed yourself about? Was it George no, Graham? No. I said George Graham when the answer was Kenny Dalglish. Oh. But, yeah. My wife later that night was like, you will need to get over this <laughs> at some point. Because it was looking like said late, I, I thought you said late last night there for a minute. Like, <laughs> no, yeah, no. no, you do need to go over it. Yeah, yeah. This morning, actually. Wow, those are the stakes. As producer Charlie... And Daniel's story go up against each other today. Of course, they met in last year's tournament. It was producer Charlie who won the quarterfinal against Daniel to go all the way on to the final where he won. Today, then, for a place in the semi-final to face Tom Williams, let's get the questions underway. First up, Daniel, it's you. Question one. Two players have scored four times in a game in the Premier League this season. Which two? Uh, Erling Harland against Wolves yeah Harland against Wolves and Cole Palmer is correct Daniel story with the scorey mm. uh, Charlie who won manager of the month award three times in a row at the start of this season Ange Postacoglu is correct of course it was Ange question two then Charlie in Man United's treble season, 1998-99, their Champions League group featured them, Bronby, and which two are the European sides? Bayern Munich and Barcelona. Is correct. <sighs> Daniel, your second question. In Manchester United's treble season, 1998-99, who did they beat on the final day of the season to win the Premier League title? Hmm. I can't remember. Uh, I've got no idea, which is really poor. Middlesbrough? It was not Middlesbrough, it was Tottenham Hotspur. Hmm. Tottenham Hotspur. Hmm. All right, an early lead for producer Charlie Jones. Question three then. Daniel, which hmm. of the following players turned out for both Barcelona and Real Madrid? George Popescu? George Haji? It's Hagi or Haji. I never know how to pronounce it. Haji. Haji. Davor Suka and Fernando Coto. Which of those four played for both Barcelona and Real Madrid? Oh, which played for both? Yeah. Uh, Do you want the names again? Please. So one of these fellows, which of the following players played for both Barcelona and Real Madrid? George Popescu, George Haji, Davor Suka and Fernando Coto. Uh, it's Haji. It is. Pulling level, but Charlie with the chance to retake the lead as we ask you, which of these following players turned out for both Milan and Inter? 
Christian Vieri, Leonardo, Daniele Massaro, and Laurent Blanc, which played for both Milan and Inter. So it's Vieri, Leonardo, Blanc, and Massaro. You're correct. Um... My instinct is Vieri, so I'll say Vieri. He's correct. 3-2 then as we head into question four. Daniel, all of the following venues have hosted a European Championships final, but one of them has not also hosted a Champions League or European Cup final. So I'm going to give you a list of stadiums. They've all hosted European Championships finals, but only one of them hasn't also been the venue for European club football's biggest game. Is it the Maracanã in Belgrade? Is it the Parc des Princes in Paris? Is it the Ulevi in Gothenburg? Or is it De Kuyp in Rotterdam? Or the Kaup? And in the right pronunciation, I will try. Uh, the Mara Okay, the Maracanã in Belgrade. The Parc des Princes in Paris. The Ulevi in Gothenburg. And De Kaup in Rotterdam? Now, which one of those, they've all been European Championship final venues, but one of them hasn't been th the site of either a Champions League or European Cup final. That's yeah, a problem, so I thought, no, yeah, it's just a problem because I thought only one of them had when you read them out. Right. Um, that's not ideal. Uh, well, I mean, the part of France, I think, is the one, <laughs> is one I was definitely sure had. Okay, we'll uh, take that off the list. Yeah, that's a good but, start, I suppose. I mean, yeah, not good enough. Of the other three, which one hasn't been yeah. the venue of a Champions League European Cup final? I mean, I don't know. Is the only answer? Uh, Belgrade feels like it would have hosted one. So let's no, but maybe. Hmm. Gonna have to press you for an answer. Belgrade, Gothenburg, or Rotterdam? And this is. It hasn't hosted a European Cup or Champions League final. Uh, I'll go for the Ulevi, but I don't know. Daniel. It's correct! Ooh. Yay! You pulled That's level. Complete guess. That's in no so way a like partisan challenge. yelp of satisfaction. Just, you know, for keeping things going into question five. But, Charlie, here's your chance to retake the lead. Now, as I ask you your question four, which of the following English venues has not hosted the final of a European club oh. competition, not including two-legged finals where an English team played. So which of these has not hosted the final, a final of a European club, club competition? The Etihad, Villa Park, Old Trafford or Anfield? Which of those has not hosted the final of a European club competition? Etihad, Villa Park, Etihad, Old, Villa Trafford, Old Trafford or Anfield? So I feel... Fairly confident of mm. saying Anfield. Yes. Oh, your confidence is well placed, sir, because you oh, now got four so out of four. That feels Meaning, tougher than my question, I think, but we carry on. We move on. Tougher than your question. Very sporting of you, Daniel. Yeah, uh, question another, five, then. I question wish. five, and Daniel now needing yes. not only to win his own fixture, but also, Charlie, to have a Man City against West Ham style collapse. In his question five, but Daniel, Juve yes. have won the Champions League or European Cup twice. Yep. Can you name either of the managers in charge at the time? Uh, hmm. I mean, yeah, I think Lippi was in charge. You certainly can name one of them. All right. The other one you could have had was? I hate the way that you doubt yourself on this quiz. <laughs> yeah, no, Lippy Obvs in 96. But who's the other one? Okay. You don't have to. Have to. I mean, it's the, it's the kind of classic, it's the classic yesteryear Platini team Juve manager. Trapatoni. Trapatoni, yeah. Was it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, but this now. Don't waste your right answer on that, Charlie. <laughs> but this now. So Daniel's pulled level with you, producer Charlie. Will this take us to a tiebreaker 
or can you seal your place in that semi-final against Tom Williams? Your question five, Juventus went unbeaten for a whole Serie A season in 2011-12. Who was their manager on that occasion? <clears throat> Antonio Conte is correct. Is correct. Drop marks, this lad. That's five out of five. Manchester City, and you have to say that's magnificent. Yeah. Mm. One hundred and fifteen charges. <laughs> <laughs> I think I lost five four to Charlie last year in the quarterfinals. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's no shame in it, Daniel. There's no shame in it. These are the it's standards. Just shame in everything else. That's that's right. <laughs> No, but a, a very creditable performance. Yeah. Well done yeah. pulling Gottenberg out, out of the bag. And uh, and yeah, thank you for taking part, Daniel. As always, a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure. And just while you're on, many thanks for all your, your wonderful insights and, and, and illuminations throughout this season. Because I, we'll be speaking to you post-season, but you're not on on Sunday in the final day because you've chosen to go to Luton Fulham. So we've binned you off. <laughs> What yeah, was behind that? <laughs> what, uh, what's the well, thinking well, there, Dan? Well, the idea is to... <laughs> I've watched Luton a fair amount this season and at no point has anyone moaned and berated the players and booed the team off or groaned right. at any manager, managerial decision. And I kind of... It feels kind of nice that this team is going to mm. leave the Premier League the way they came up it, with everyone sort of being happy with their lot. So I thought I'd do a bit of a long read on that. No, good for you. Good also, you. you might not know this, the, you can get through way and through a terrace house. <laughs> <laughs> Makes notes on pad of paper. Brilliant. Danny, have a great trip to Sunny Luton on Sunday and uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon. And uh, congratulations on your performance, but above all, congratulations to producer Charlie. Through to the semi-final, Tom Williams awaits and he'll be feeling pretty spooked right now. Hey, Tom Williams, as you hear this. Mm. Charlie, how'd you feel? Good. I, all I wanted to do was not do a, a Napoli in terms of a title oh, defence, yeah, so fair. I feel like that's been avoided now. Well, you certainly have. Magnificent stuff. Magnificent stuff. And that brings us to the end of today's Totally Football show. We'll be getting on to the semi-finals next week, of course, of the competition. Uh, before that, on Sunday, we'll be reviewing the final day of the Premier League <laughs> season. So do hope you'll join us for that, listener. Many thanks in the meantime to Sasha. To Charlie uh, Eccleshare, slight confusion there. To Charlie Eccleshare, to Duncan Alexander, uh, to producer Charlie in and out of the booth, and Liam very much in it. And you, listener, good Lord. Always good to have you on board. We'll speak to you soon. For now, from all of us here, it's goodbye. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views we've got stats we've got analysis we've got some of the best football writers around and the whole thing is absolutely free so have a listen on spotify or apple podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below